wish to pay at all and whose only ambition is to uh, get uh, a property that is considerably uh, less expensive than their next door neighbour who has had to pay a mortgage in the normal way. So the point, the point I, I wish to make there is this. Uh, to what extent is it possible to encourage the lenders to give the compassion and the consideration to those who are making that effort? Because the situation, as you know, Mr Chairman, yourself, the, the, the householders are appearing in court in tears, desperate, knowing that they'll be turning a rock and a hard place. And we have to do something that recognises their particular plight. And I'll move on quickly to, to, to uh, uh, land hoarding. Uh, I'm not sh sure that it's land hoarding. I think it has something to do with the prices that we inherited from the boom that don't seem to have gone down. And I'll give you this quote and, and I'll ask you if, if you wish to address it. A, a property valuer said to me during, during the initial stages of NAMA, when property prices were being, were being, the property was being bought at a reduced price, 46, 48 percent, whatever the case may be. He said to me, they're worth about 10 percent. Properties were worth about 10 percent at the time. Now, he was in the business. And he, he, I think he knew what he was doing. Last point I want to make is the question about voluntary surrender. Uh, Claire uh, made an important, I think, intervention there. I think one of the things that we see all the time is that people are being encouraged to voluntarily surrender. It, that's not voluntary surrender. They're given a list of options, none of which, none of which are, are ones that are acceptable. And again, it affects households with children. And it's just horrendous to see the effect it has on the families. So my, my, my question there is, is it not, and can, it be, can, it, can we encourage the lending institutions again, given that they themselves were accommodated compassionately by the Irish taxpayer, and who will continue to accommodate them well into the future? I'm not getting into the place of burning bondholders or anything like that at all, because I don't agree with that nonsense, because that comes back to bite you as well. But it is necessary to impress upon the lenders that they were accommodated by the, Irish, by the Irish nation, and they in turn should now be in some way inclined to uh, respond. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Mr. Sweetman, I don't know how many of those fall within your remit, but... Uh... Two of them, uh, if I may, um, Deputy Durgan, thank you. Um, on the central bank question, uh, ultimately, I'm just a private citizen. It's a personal, private view. But what I would like to see is that in factoring in, uh, nobody wants to go back to uh, the crisis or the difficulties that we've had. Absolutely not. The central bank does have other tools at its disposal in relation to how it managed may, might control the market. Um, I would simply like to see that in... Uh, the decisions that it makes in relation to financial stability, that it factors in the long term as well as the short term view, and I never see that that is done. That, that's my net point in relation to that. that the long term cost of preventing people being able to buy a house uh, might have a much more significant issue than is factored in at the moment. Um, there are other measures available. Um, I'm touching on one of the other points that you make in relation to uh, cost too high. Um, uh, the other thing that's put out there, and again, this is just a private citizens uh, comment in relation to the government take um, the proportion often mentioned is that the government takes one third of the cost of the price of the house now if if they reduce that by half and three times as many houses were built then on pure mats that would be a gain and no cost so uh, I think it's something which really needs to be looked at uh, in the question of why haven't the costs gone down it comes down to the question as well building costs extraordinarily apparently, have not come down, even though the market is so fundamentally different to what it was. I can't explain that. That might be one for uh, the Chartered Surveyors tomorrow, uh, an interesting one. And the final point that I will make is, in relation to uh, servicing a mortgage as opposed to paying a rent, uh, what I often hear is that it's cheaper to get a mortgage than it is to pay a rent. Thank you, Mr. Sweetman. Deputy O'Rourke. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Sweetman and Ms. Lockton. I suppose uh, just on the repossessions, uh, uh, Patrick, just to get your view uh, on, in relation to uh, where you're dealing, where you've got tenants dealing with, or home occupiers dealing with, both local authorities and banks, and when they actually, because of the current uh, financial situation, they've fallen foul of work and they're making a contribution, but it might be only half of what they should be making with the repayment, but they're still brought to court for repossession. And they're actually fighting against that repossession order, which I've done for a number of my constituents. What's your view on how that could be strengthened, their position could be strengthened, that they could deal with what they can afford to pay on that basis? And although the arrears are accruing, 
it's surely not good enough for a reason not to give them space to deal with that and see how they can improve their situation rather than having a repossession grant us, putting them out into the streets, putting them back to the local authority that Claire has spoke to, which actually they don't actually have any asset to give them anyway. So isn't that something, I'd like just your view on that and how that can be dealt with just to make sense of all that because currently in my view it makes no sense it, what's happening at the moment with courts and, and that situation. Secondly, in relation to, I totally agree with your CPO and, uh, and your position on CPO of land. My view, I represent Kildare North. The local authority has quite a number of land banks. It may not have enough of land banks to deal with, deal with all the social starter housing, but certainly is enough to get the house construction, local authority house construction started, which has not, not happened for years. And my view is, though, at the moment, you have local area plans and county development plans being developed, and we're, there's a problem getting land zoned for people who is willing to go tomorrow morning with the digger and build houses if they get the planning and get through the system. Because of these lands that are zoned, have been left there for 25 years and are just accruing capital. So if we're not going to CPO them, and I do agree with you, by the way, that's, what's the best way, in your view, legally, of trying to deal with that from those sitting on those land banks and preventing other people from having land zoned that will help contribute to solving the problem. And in your second point to say on page two, what can be done, I believe your second bullet point there is very relevant. It's a, it's a mix of private sector and local authority that needs to come together. We're not reinventing the wheel here. We just need to get up and do something. Stop talking about it. My God, never heard so much talk and nothing being done. And still we have people lying on footpaths. To Claire, just in relation to you, Claire, uh, in relation to a HAP, RAS and all of that a support mechanism, I agree they're not ideal, but they are, they're not ideal, but they're better than nothing. And without those supports of HAP, RAS and RIN supplement, we'd have an awful lot more people, you know, in a very difficult situation at the moment. So they do provide a temporary home, although it's very temporary. In re what is your view in overcoming the barrier in relation to the actual... Uh, um, people who actually are separated and because they join custody they will get accommodated but the people that as you say just doesn't have joint custody but wants their family to stay overnight and they can't do it because the local authority will not allow them to actually uh, get accommodation or pay rent for accommodation in that situation so actually in most cases the father of the ch children one or two children actually never gets to spend any time with that child bar during daylight hours. And in relation to couples that have actually repossession being granted against them, in local authorities, they cannot get on the social housing list to actually get supports to rent a property for their family because they're still, although they've been, they're out of a property, this, and because their name is attached to us, has not gone through the courts completely, and they're not detached from that deed, they cannot get, that's a preventative uh, for, and a block from getting them on the social housing. So what's the best way of dealing with that in your view? Is it through affidavit or is it through a change? Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Take them very quickly, and the ones for me on the repossession wouldn't be specifically my area, but I absolutely agree that it makes no economic sense to go through the whole process and then put someone out on the street and have to be housed again. It makes no sense at all. I think the dilemma is to have a process or to have a procedure which distinguishes between the can't pays and the won't pays, um, and the can't pays should be accommodated in every conceivable way. Um, and maybe issues of attachment to earnings and or social welfare payments or otherwise, uh, of whatever amount the court deems could be paid, the won't pays obviously have to be dealt with. Uh, on the land banks, what can you do? Uh, number one uh, would be uh, make it more profitable to actually bring that land to uh, market or make it profitable, and two, um, to uh, remove some of the inhibitors. And we talked, uh, we heard earlier about planning. There are very serious inhibitors in the planning process. If they can be streamlined, um, such that you had, for example, Board Planola has a statutory guideline within which it has to make decisions. I understand it is uh, prioritizing housing planning applications, it could have a statutory time frame within which it had to make its decision. That would be a really big move towards bringing <coughs> land through for uh, residential development. Ms. Nocton. Yes, thank you, Deputy. Um, I suppose the first issue in relation to rent supplement, HAP and RAS, 
they're, they are solutions if the property was available. If they were solutions, then we wouldn't have so many people living in hotels and, and hostels. So are, they're, not, they're not solutions at the moment. And obviously, again, these are my own views and not the views of the Law Society, but it is a policy issue, it's a financial issue. So yes, if they worked, they would be fantastic options. Um, the second issue in relation to the, the parental position, I suppose if I, look at the, if I can look at the allocation schemes of the various local authorities within the Greater Dublin area, what many of them do is allow for a second bedroom allocation. So they may allocate, they may allow for an allocation for two bedrooms where it's a separated parent. Um, however, um, my experience, for example, with Dublin City Council would be that they only allow for the one, the one bedroom and then you have to try and get somebody to argue your position as to why you should be entitled to a second bedroom, um, even though you may have four children. In relation to the last question, just to remind me what your last question was, apologies. The last question was in relation to the actual, uh, where you've got a couple, uh, that, that the, repossession. The, the repossession has been yeah. granted, and because the deed is still attached to the name, it's to go through a legal, a yeah. legal process, and that actually prohibits them from actually getting on a local authority Again. list to get assistance. Like yeah, so about. they can't get, as I mentioned, they can't get on the, they can't get on the full, they can't get on the full, they can't benefit from the full range of social housing support, but they can benefit from. from the limited forms, which again are, RA, are RAS, HAP, and rent supplement, and again they're not workable solutions at the moment. The uh, view, it's a resource. Sorry, issue. chair. Can I just say very clear? Actually, yeah. no. In, in in my own constituency, and Deputy Durkin can correct me, yeah. is that to actually avail of HAP or RAS, you must actually be on the social housing list. You must be on the on the social housing list. And one of the barriers of getting on a social housing list, although we try to work around with it after David's or whatever, is actually if you are attached to a deed which has been repossessed and has gone through a lengthy process. So that is a problem. The 2014 Act, um, I think it's, it might be Section 49 of the 2014 Act, has a provision which allows for local authorities to discount, I suppose, the property f f simply for the purposes of, or simply in a situation where it hasn't been dealt with yet. Um, I think I have the definition here. I'll just, I'll have to read, it. I'll just read it out. Um, definition is um, where the local authority is unable to establish for the time being whether alternative accommodation is available to a household that would meet the household's housing needs. So that's the position that needs to be argued, that that legislation is there to, I would argue, to, to deal with people in this scenario. Um, there, are, there are one or two conditions around it. I think they must keep the local authority informed of any change in circumstance in relation to the property. And if the property then becomes not available or available for whatever reason, again, there's an obligation, I think, to go back to the local, local authority. I can't remember the specific wording of it, but that provision is there. It's there in the 2014 legislation, um, and the local authority should be following it, I would imagine. And whether or not they qualify, they, they obviously are, whether or not they interpret that um, this is one of the scenarios that it should that should benefit, but I would imagine that it should be. And if it isn't, well, then there's a greater gap in the legislation than I already thought there was. It's interpretation. I'll talk yeah. to you about that separately, uh, Deputy O'Rourke. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, it's I'm, a problem I'm conscious, I'm conscious of the, the time at this stage, so I'm going to take the three remaining contributions together, if that's okay with colleagues. Deputy Coppinger. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, just in relation to Mr. Sweetman's contribution, um, one of the reasons that we suggested this session was to look at legislation, including emergency legislation that might be required to stop people becoming homeless and to sort out the housing emergency that we have. And the issue of CPOs is an important one that this committee needs to get views on. Now, in your presentation, you gave the impression that you didn't like CPOs because they were cumbersome and unviable. But firstly, to say in relation to land, it is absolutely not the case that local authorities have enough land in all cases, zoned, that they can build on. It certainly is not the case in my local authority where I have the information compiled now in Dublin West, which has probably got the biggest housing crisis in the whole country based on figures. There's one patch of land that the council has left zoned, 15 acres. It is, and it, all in one location it happens to be the most deprived area as well, of course. Um, so it is absolutely not the case. We can't solve the housing crisis unless we are able to get privately owned land in Dublin West and in Dublin 15. So uh, even the, 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 the council has a lot of industrially zoned land 
that it has a deal with the IDA. Some of it wouldn't be suitable for housing because you'd be in the middle of an industrial estate, Other, others may be. But, but one of the other reasons we put this down as a topic was the whole question of vulture funds. Now, I know you don't like the use of the word, but I think it has to be said in relation to yourself, you have a connection and an interest in that you are a lead partner in Matheson, which has connections with these vulture funds. Like, as in, you were a lead partner in the, in the commercial and property department, Matheson has 125 US companies registered at its address in John Rogerson's Key, and it gives tax minimisation advice to international clients, some of whom are vulture funds. Uh, the chair of Matheson is the sole shareholder in European Property Fund, where I was out this morning with residents from my area who are threatened with eviction by European Property Fund. So, you know, just to say that you may have a, an interest. But um, the, the other thing I wanted to take up was your idea that home ownership is this great equaliser of the classes. In fact, it's the opposite. Home ownership, if you like, has become the way that you climb above other people and the way that people are being blocked out. If you look at Dublin now, we now have a 50-50 situation between people who own their homes and who rent, simply because of unaffordability. And just because people, of course, buy their house doesn't mean they're not working class suddenly, you know, um, that, you know just to say that. Um, but you mentioned the pension time bomb. In fact, I would read it the opposite way to yourself, because one of the big spurs to the whole buy-to-let thing was building workers and others who were self-employed buying a house for their pension. Right? But now look at where these people are. They have these second or third houses that they bought because they were told to buy them. And they don't want to be landlords. And in fact, you know, the whole thing has fallen belly up. So um, would it not be better to introduce proper pensions for people? But also, would you not agree that in your old age, actually, the idea of having a publicly owned house, you know, probably in, 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 smaller than what you had before, um, or even, you know, sheltered housing in the case of some people as they get older. But the idea that private housing kind of protects people, because 30 and 40 year mortgages is the norm now. So a lot of people have to stay working longer. And they'd be working, I know teachers working until they're all sorts of ages now. Um, and, and just the last thing to say is that not all the, the sellers are willing, and a lot of them aren't willing to sell. And so these vulture funds, I mean, I'm trying to encourage the government or the, the council or whatever to buy the Tyrrellstown to keep people in their homes. Um, and sometimes uh, like that that's the only way i see that those people can avoid being becoming homeless particularly in our area but the talks haven't gone well so therefore i do think the whole issue of compulsory purchase does come into play thank you thank you deputy deputy harty yeah, just uh, two questions uh, chairman for for claire um claire in relation to medical priority um Quite often, as a GP, patients would come in to me looking for medical evidence in relation to either moving from a house that the house they're in is poor condition, damp, or affecting their health, and the other is the effect of their themselves or their or their children. So I would give medical evidence in relation to that. Is is that then passed on to a, a medical officer employed by the council to verify or to check or? To, to have additional assessments. And the second is in relation to nationality. Are, are you saying that um, if you're not an Irish national, you don't have the same right or status in, in getting a, a house? Deputy Byrne. Thanks, um, thanks um, Chair. Just say thank you very much for your presentations. And I suppose um, I, I was just going to uh, pick up on the same thing again about, about medical applications, particularly when they come across your desk, and I know when they come across mine, a lot of them are uneligible. You can't even read some of them, to be honest with you. But um, I, I, I with the greatest respect to, to GPs, the letters from GPs don't even, I don't even think they get any kind of uh, input into whether or not medical priority is given and it's down then to if somebody is attending a doctor and a consultant and the length of time having to wait that to get that that's one of, that's one of the main things I see the length of time actually getting a medical report or a medical assessment of children now with ADHD and that then takes so long so um, I suppose um, I spoke about um, Mr Sweetman you spoke about um, 
uh, local authorities and about those who pay and those who don't pay or those who want to pay and those who just won't, won't pay. And I suppose that can be said as well for local authority housing. We had uh, Dick Brady from Dublin City Council in a few weeks ago, uh, three meetings ago, and the amount of money that's owned to Dublin City Council is in the millions for rent for rent arrears. And I think that's a real issue uh, where, what should be looked at by the councils right across the country because it is uh, providing housing for people who just won't want, don't want to pay, basically, and that's it. Now, there are people in arrears for other reasons, but there's a lot out there who just don't want to pay. Um, the other thing is, I suppose we can talk till the cows come home, as they say, but unless we have action, unless we kind of really have the land to be able to build on, and, and as a member of the government, I know we have provided a lot of money in my own local area for building houses and buying houses, but we do need to make a more ordinary approach to it and that's why this committee has been set up but what is your views around um, if you have any at all about local authority housing and the local authority building all housing for everybody because I really believe whether you're a local authority ten public tenant or a young private couple who are out there working their backs off and really the chances of them ever owning their own property what do you feel about uh, local authorities building and providing a rent uh, to buy kind of mortgage thing for for young couples, whether they're unemployed or whether employed, because I think that's very important. I think that's the way to go. Thank Just you, Deputy Byrne. Mr. Sweetman, in particular, when you're replying, because it came up a number of times uh, about uh, land hoarding and whether it's been held or not, and your your reply was very much uh, to incentivise and free it up to the market. Uh, and I suppose others might feel there's a carrot and stick approach that uh, maybe land hoarding would be taxed, and that might be. The, the stick side of it, um, that quite clearly, you know, within the resources available, there's only certain incentives that can be given. So, you know, to address what is needed in the public good, is there another side that should be looked at? And I suppose, should, they be dealt, should it be dealt with in parallel? So, in other words, there is a carrot and stick, and that uh, holding uh, land, particularly in areas where, where services are available, uh, when we are viewing a national emergency at the moment, uh, do we have to have the other side of that equation? And you might address all of those together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, um, again, a fair number of points. Just in relation to Deputy uh, Coppinger, um, I, I didn't actually make any suggestion that local authorities had enough lands. Um, uh, that was uh, somebody else made that suggestion. Um, what I was saying was that uh, for local authorities uh, to access the lands that they require, the additional lands, uh, it would be far cheaper, much more efficient, and much quicker for them to go out and buy the land on the open market rather than using a CPO procedure, which would be slower uh, and much more expensive ultimately. Um, and, and I didn't quite address um, Deputy O'Rourke's question earlier on when he talked about can you use a CPO to acquire land at a discounted price, which I think was probably the essence of what he was asking on that. And the problem there, um, and, and there has been discussion previously in relation to constitutional issues and what the actual constitutional position is, and we heard it earlier on again today, uh, the Kenny report and, and, and many other commentators have always suggested that if you are looking to take in land at less than the current open market value, that's a constitutional issue. Um, and I, I really can't really put that one much further. Uh, addressing then the Chair's comment in relation to the carrot and stick approach, there is of course the vacant land tax which has just been brought in in relation to people hoarding land uh, or holding on land and not bringing it forward to the market. So that has been dealt with, but uh, on the question of limited resources, I would argue um, that uh, in pure maths, in pure sums, um, by bringing in incentives which would um, encourage more building and encourage more people to be able to acquire property, um, that that will pay for itself and that it will be a much more um, uh, economically uh, better way of going about it. And in that context, I might take um, Deputy Byrne's comment in relation to building um, for everybody. The difficulty there is that there's a finite resource and if you're going to build for everybody, uh, it would be an extraordinarily expensive um, process to try to do that. Uh, and also in trying to coordinate um, to some central process that 20 to 30,000 units were built by a single entity centrally every year would be a real challenge. Um, so I, I, I think there'd be real difficulties with that and I think the better way to go about it is the dual approach of local authorities being financed and encouraged to build and provide housing and the private sector also playing its part in building 
uh, housing. Um, I was going to take uh, Ms. Coppinger's last point next, and I've just lost a little bit. Um, not all willing sellers, I think that was the point there. Um, no, of course, not everybody is a willing seller, but I would say there are enough willing sellers out there um, if there was the resource. I mean, I'm not conscious that any local authority or any government agency has actually sought to acquire any of these land banks uh, or has gone out there as appointed agents with a view to acquiring these land banks. Uh, they could of course have bought them at uh, the same competitive rates uh, had they wished to do so in the past. Now, okay, we're in a crisis now, we need to deal with it now. Uh, they need to be resourced to do that. Uh, and if the local authorities or state agency, whichever way it goes, is resourced to buy land, the land will be available. Sorry, just to clarify, yeah. I was referring to the houses that people are threatened with eviction from by sure. these vulture funds, yes. and the, the council has been in discussions for months with EPF. In the context of um, resolving a, a housing issue, um, the option of buying the house rather than having someone put out in the street is probably a much more cost-efficient way of going about it, absolutely. Um, I think I'd agree with uh, Deputy Commander um, in relation to uh, the question of home ownership, and in fact, I think you're making my point in a different way. It is the great equaliser, it is the great uh, uh, opportunity for people, uh, and instead of having people with two or three houses, or because they have one house can then afford to buy another house, whether it be for their family or otherwise, if um, the family have bought their house, whether it be through local authority or privately, uh, in the past, it uh, gives them the resource to enable a family member to buy a house in the future because they have an asset which they can put to doing that. And, and I stand over the comment that it is a great equaliser um, in allowing uh, people to improve dramatically their financial circumstance. And I, I mentioned earlier on in relation to uh, the Dublin uh, City Council scheme being reintroduced in relation to uh, tenant purchase schemes, that's very much to be welcomed because it plays to that exact point. Um, you took issue with my question in relation to vulture funds to private equity funds, that's just where I've come from. Uh, yes, I have been, uh, and you're absolutely right, I, I was a partner with Madison, I'm not actually a partner now, I'm not actually practicing as a solicitor now, um, but um, I, I, I think the use of the phrase vulture fund is disparaging and, and I simply prefer to use it as private equity fund. Um, there was one other question I thought on the pension time bomb question and, and, and the talk about um, uh, where um, that goes in the future. I would like to see that there were sufficient numbers of people who could fend for themselves which would then allow the limited state resources to be applied to those most in need. So what you do is you allow some uh, people or those people that can afford to fend for themselves and the more of them the better that increases the amount of state resources that are available to support those that actually need it rather than having a, a blanket a safety net for everybody. I think that answers my Ms. Norton, there were a couple of questions directed at you. Yes, yeah, so firstly, Deputy Harty, in respect of your question relating to non-Irish nationals or Irish nationals, um, or Deputy Durkin, I think, um, there are certainly... Um, there's no restriction in housing legislation as to uh, there's no restriction in housing le legislation as to who can apply or what nationalities can apply for social housing. Um, that restriction comes in under the e our EU obligations, um, and um, certainly um, the difficulty arises, particularly for people who, as I said, who can't, who may be HRC compliant, who may be able to prove a connection with the country, but the way in the way in which the questions are posed by the local authority, they can't meet those questions. For example, the big question that comes up a lot is, can you show 52 weeks of work? Um, and that doesn't apply, for example, to, to a child who's just become of, of age and wasn't in a position to show 52 weeks of work, but may have a good connection with the country. So that would be an example of that. In relation to the medical priority situation, it's the difficulty is, is that it varies from local authority to local authority. There is certainly, in legislation, it does require, I think, I'm not sure if it's in the, the primary act or in the statutory instrument, it does require, um, for example, a consultant's report. I certainly know, from a positive point of view, um, Dublin City Council have have don't necessarily require as, as high as a level of, as a consultant's report. Apologies. I think the legislation looks for um, a report from a member of staff, or from a medical practitioner within the HSE, actually, I think. So it's, it's very, it's very it varies from local authority to local authority. The legislation says something different to what the local authorities say. Um, so even from that point of view, if like I can't even advise somebody without checking as to what they actually need to bring in um, or to, to produce to the local authority. It's very, it's very unclear from at the outset as to what they actually need. Um, they have to either check their local authority 
and to find out from them, or they have to check the legislation and see what because they are they are different. Um, and even with that, um, some local authorities won't be satisfied with just a GP report. They'll want to report from a consultant, um, as Deputy Byrne mentioned. And the difficulty can be, can be, for example, if you're waiting to see a neurologist in. The, in Within a, in a private in a public appointment, you can be waiting a long, long time. So, in order to prove your medical condition, to even request medical priority can take a long time. And even with that, as I said, there's difficulties then at the next stage. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Norton. Mr. Chairman, a quick, just a quick, quick very there. quickly because we're. I don't. Want to, it's very quick. Can we cut to the chase on, on this one about 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 uh, repossessions and and the sale of of loan books to unregulated third parties? Can, what would, would, would your opinion be, and then and, and, um, Deputy should raise the issue as well, correctly so to my mind, to, uh, to give some, some degree of assurance to the people in their houses who are under threats at the present time, is it, not, is it not desirable to assume that a regime can prevail whereby the, the purchaser of the loan books should be obliged to enter into negotiations uh, along the lines that were originally uh, entered into by the original lender. There's, there's, no need, there's no need to go any further. And I should you mention that what expand. Michael Noonan said as well was he preferred, he preferred the benefits of any arrangements to go directly to the borrower or the homeowner rather than to those providing uh, the, 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 the your, bill. Your the question is clear, question. Deputy Durkin. Uh, Mr. Yes. Your Sorry question, that, Chairman. Your question is clear. Mr. Sweetman, do you want to Unfortunately, conclude Unfortunately, the answer point? is not. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, decline to, uh, to, to, to even try to tease that one out because it becomes a legal problem. It becomes an issue as to the extent to which the original uh, loan transaction with the original bank is binding on the bank's successor in title. Um, and that depends on all the individual circumstance and I wouldn't even attempt at a, at a general broad generalisation. But the, the, the view you express is a reasonable one, obviously. <coughs> At this stage, uh, Ms. Norton, uh, Mr. Sweetman, thank you for your, first of all, your presentations and uh, your reply to the various questions here. Um, you've been very helpful and informative to the committee. At this stage, colleagues, we'll suspend until two o'clock. Thank you. <coughs>